Hello again. In today's video, I want to expand on my previous video where I provided an overview of Text Mesh Pro's dynamic system to show how we can use it to create font assets that are both static or dynamic. But in this case, we created dynamic font assets to support Chinese, Japanese, and Korean text. Now, today I'm going to expand on that to show how we could create a, a font asset and use the fallback system to support multiple languages and how we would go about structuring this. So the first step to accomplishing this task is to identify the languages you want to support and to find font files that have the glyph coverage for those given languages. Now, in my case, I often use, like I said yesterday, Google Fonts or My Fonts, where there's thousands of fonts available. And uh, Google Fonts, for example, it's pretty easy to sort fonts based on what languages they support. Now, in today's video, I'm going to stick to using Noto Serif. Uh, we could use Noto Sam, but there's lots of different font files available with uh, support for multiple languages and the Noto uh, font family happens to have coverage for pretty much every single language. I mean, there's literally over a hundred font files available. Um, so, but ultimately from a design point of view, you would have consistency between all the different languages. But it's also important to understand that the dynamic system allows you to fall back to any other font file regardless of whether or not it's the same thing. So this is purely a visual design point of view of, uh, for instance, there's a lot of users who will pick a certain font for their Latin text. But even if that font family happens to have support for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, it doesn't mean they like the visual design of the glyphs for those specific language. So it's very common for users to pick one font for Latin text and a completely different one for Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, or any other language. Back in our project, we can see that I imported several fonts. We have the Noto Serif regular that we're gonna use for Latin text, and the Chinese, Japanese, Korean version, and then the Taiwanese version. So we're gonna create a text object which by default will be assigned the Liberation Sound. And why is it assigned the Liberation Sound? Just quickly covering that. So if we go in our TMP settings, whenever a new text object is created, it's going to use the default font asset that's assigned here, which is Liberation Sound. If you wanted to change that, that's where you change it. So back to our text object, I'm gonna grab some text off screen that I'm going to copy and paste in our inspector. And we'll take a look at what happens. So I'll change the margins because it's too wide. So what we're going to see is we're still using Liberation Sans. And Liberation Sans actually includes support for Cyrillic, Greek, and Vietnamese. But clearly it's missing Chinese, Japanese, and Korean and Thai. So let's create a new dynamic font asset uh, using our newly imported fonts. So we're going to choose our Noto Serif Regular. Control Shift F12 will allow us to create a dynamic font asset. And we're gonna go and assign it to our text object. So now we can see that the same languages, Cyrillic, Greek, and Vietnamese were all good. We still have our missing characters for Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, and Thai. Now, later in the demo, I'm gonna explain um, how we can control what glyph is actually shown when we have a missing glyph. So let's go ahead and create a dynamic font asset for our Chinese, Japanese, and Korean text. Again, Control Shift F12. Now, the question is, how are we going to tell our text object that it needs to find this font asset here? So in the previous video, I talked about the fallback system. So what we're going to do is we're going to select our primary, and, and I'm going to label it also as a master font asset. This is basically the head of our fallback tree. So if I select this one, when the text system is looking for the glyphs, it's going to always look at your primary font asset, which is the one assigned to the text object. And then as it looks at it, it's going to look if it has any fallbacks assigned to it. And in this case, we don't have any. So we're gonna add a fallback, which will be our Chinese, Japanese, and Korean dynamic font asset. And I see, as soon as I do that, we can see on screen that now the text with those languages is all fine. Now we still have the Thai text that's not showing up. That's because we didn't create that asset yet. But this is how you would assign um, to your primary slash master 
you would set up your fallback here. Now to support tie, it's the same process. I simply select it, Control Shift F12, go back to my primary slash master, create a second entry, and just drag it in. And then we now have our tie characters being displayed. Next, we're going to take a look at the fallback chain sequence or search pattern, just so we understand better the flexibility that it will provide you and to also understand where that missing glyph is coming from. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a new scene and create a new text object real quick. Uh, this text object is going to have our liberation sign uh, as the default font asset, and I'm just going to type two letters. So first thing I'm going to do is we've got AB. We know it's coming from Liberation Saint. I'm going to type slash U03A9, which is the UTF-16 notation to uh, reference uh, a 16-bit character. And if I wanted to reference a 32-bit character, I would go slash uppercase U 0001F600. And this is the UTF-32 uh, notation. So both of these uh, are C-sharp also conventions, so they work in strings, and that's how you would reference uh, a UTF-16 or UTF-32. Now, what I did here is kind of interesting, because I, I have AB, which is coming from Liberation Saint. But if we were to look at the Atlas of Liberation Saint, we would notice that this Omega character is not in there. Why? Well, because our Liberation Sun is static and it was generated with the extended ASCII set, which does not include the Greek characters. But when we look at our Liberation Sun font asset, we're going to see that it has a fallback assigned to it. And its fallback, if I select it, is dynamic and it does indeed contain the Omega character. Now, for the sake of this demo, I'm going to break or remove this fallback from the chain just so we can see that we now have the missing glyph character. So in the search pattern, we look at the primary. Then we look if the primary has fallbacks of its own. It doesn't. Then Text Mesh Pro goes and looks if there's a local sprite asset assigned to the text object, and there is none right now, and that might be confusing as to why we're looking for a sprite asset, but I'll circle back to this. But in this case, we have none. At which point, these three things, the primary font asset, its fallback, and the sprite asset are considered the local fallbacks or resources. Then we're going to go to the global ones, which if we go in our TMP settings, this here we can specify a list of global fallbacks, but we have none. And then we have a default sprite asset, which happens to be emoji one. If we were to select this emoji one, we would see in its list of characters that it has a character with a Unicode value of 1F600. And that's exactly where this is coming from. So the reason why Text Mesh Pro searches the text object to see if it has a local sprite asset assigned to it is because you can assign a Unicode value to sprites. And as a matter of fact, emojis and font files are in the UTF-32 range and they have Unicode values. That's how they're actually looked up. So this is also a reason why sprite assets in the latest versions of Text Mesh Pro have a sprite character table and a sprite glyph table. This is the same structure that you have in font files or in font assets. So now back to our missing uh, character. So if we go back to our TMP settings, like I explained, we first looked at the global list of fallback. We have none. Now we found the emoji here, but now we're looking for the Omega character. It's not contained in our spread asset. Then Text Mesh Pro is going to look at the default font asset to see if it has the fallback. And in this case, we remove the fallback from this liberation sign, so it can't find it. So at the end, when it cannot find the glyph, it's going to go here and look at the missing character Unicode. Let me expand the view a little bit. And as you can see, it's assigned Unicode 0, which is the Unicode for the missing glyph. But as a user, maybe I want to display the letter A when there's a missing character, or the letter B. Now, I could replace it by a space. So the reason why we use 0, for as annoying as the square, missing square is, 
it is designed for a purpose, which is to alert you, the developer, the user, that your font that you're using somewhere is missing glyphs. If I replaced it by a space, okay, it's not as annoying, but I'm not alerting you that there's something wrong or something missing. Next, let's take a look at why we have local fallbacks and global fallbacks. But first, let's fix our missing glyph to make sure we see it so we're alerted uh, in the event we're missing a character somewhere. So what I'm going to do is uh, set up a different scenario here. I'm going to erase these characters. And let's say I want to display Apple's logo, which is uh, F179, which is a UTF-16 Unicode. Now, where is this coming from and how can we see the logo? Well, I imported this font uh, before the demo called Font Awesome. It's a font file that contains uh, logos and symbols, uh, and it's uh, available on the internet uh, for download. So what I'm going to do is here I want to display this logo, which comes in this Font Awesome uh, font file. So we're going to need to create a font asset for it, which I did, again, by using Control-Shift-F12. Now we're going to go assign it as a fallback to our Liberation Saint. Uh, we had removed the other fallback, so we're gonna add our Font Awesome there. And as soon as I assign it again, we're gonna see that it now displays the Unicode value or the glyph and character that I've requested, which is here. Now, in this case, I have a single text object and it kind of makes sense to assign Font Awesome here. But what if I had like hundreds of text objects and I was using multiple primaries from different font families? Like for example, I have a bunch of objects using Arial and then I have a different font that I'm using for titles. And so let's say I have a dozen fonts in there, but in every case somewhere, I may want to use some symbols and graphics and logos. Well, I guess I could assign as fallback this font awesome to every single one of them, that's kind of tedious. I mean, in this case, am I not saying I want to use that globally? And that's exactly the point, which is now if I remove it and I go to my TMP settings, where those are global, which means all text objects can access it. Now, if I set up my fallback here, and I assign my font awesome. Now, every single one of my text objects, regardless of what font file they're, or font asset they're using, they're going to be able to find this. So this is the difference between local and global. So always think about, is this something that I want to fall back to specifically when I'm using this primary slash master, or is this something I'm going to use in general with everything else? The last thing I want to cover is the difference between static and dynamic font assets and some general workflow related stuff like while you're developing versus when you're getting ready to ship the project. So static font asset means that when TextMesh Pro is looking for a character, it's a simple lookup in the existing data of the font asset. And when you create a build, whatever font file was used to create this font asset is not going to be included in the build because it's not needed. Static font assets are self-sufficient. By contrast, when we're using dynamic font assets and TextMesh Pro is looking for a character, it's still going to do a lookup in the existing data, but since the font asset is dynamic, we're going to open up the font file and then look if the character exists in it, and if it does, add the character to the Atlas texture and the data structure, and those extra steps have additional performance overhead. When creating a build, the font file that was used to create the dynamic font asset will be included in the build since we need to be able to access it at runtime to try to add characters from this font file, and that will increase the build size. There is a time and place to use static font assets and dynamic font assets. You should try to make sure that all the known text in the project for any language or groups of language is contained in static font assets because that will give you best performance and best quality assurance. And then for user input or unknown text, then you rely on dynamic font assets for those. And although there's a higher performance overhead to dynamic font assets, if used properly to support user input, this performance overhead will not be noticeable by any user whatsoever because it's still extremely fast relative to human typing speed, for example. 
Finally, the last topic I want to touch on is the missing glyph and having to manually set up your fallbacks as opposed to an automatic fallback to system fonts. Now, I most certainly recognize the convenience and the benefits of being able to use system fonts, and I want to continue to improve on the support for system fonts. But the scenario I'm trying to avoid is the one where you're developing on Windows or OS X. Both happen to have over 200 OS fonts. And as you're continuing to develop development and you're getting closer to shipping and you're getting into the crunch time and you start testing on these other platforms, you suddenly realize that you were unaware that we were falling back to all these system fonts and that these fonts are not available on these other platforms or the features you depended on from those fonts are not available in these other fonts and that the fonts from a design point of view don't work well together and now you're discovering this at the last minute. So I'm all for convenience and streamlining the process and the workflows, but I think we have to be careful and balance convenience versus hiding potential crucial or critical functionality from the user. So in this case, I think hiding the fact that we're automatically falling back to system fonts is pretty risky, and I would rather have the user sort of do a little bit more work up front and be aware of what's going on exactly as opposed to like I said at the last minute you uncover this and now it's like a big issue. So I will continue like I said to look for ways to improve workflows and make the tool more intuitive and easier but I want to be careful with some of these automation where there's a liability in those that can be way costlier than the extra 30 minutes or 15 minutes required to find the font and set up the fallback. So hopefully it makes sense. So I will leave it at that. I'm going to post the video on the Unity forum. Uh, if you have feedback or questions, please feel free to post there. And thank you again for using Unity and TextMeshPro.